Hi, you're listening to Conversations with Musicians with Leah Roseman. My guest today is Gary Muzinski, a versatile percussionist and entrepreneur, and this conversation delves into his experiences playing samba in Brazil, his discovery and exploration of the handpan, and some of his work as an educator in both community music projects and as an innovator using music in the corporate world. We also talked about his beautiful album, Roots and Wings, Medicine Music, which won the gold medal best of show in the 2021 Global Music Awards and features 25 master musicians from eight countries. Gary plays several contrasting instruments in different styles during the episode, and timestamps are included in the description. Like every episode, this is available both as a video and podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, and everything is linked in the description to my podcast website, leahroseman.com. Hey, Gary Muzinski, thanks for joining me today. Hi, Leah. It's uh, it's my pleasure being here, and thanks for reaching out. Yeah, you know, I had wanted to talk to a handpan player, and of course, that's not all you do. Um, you've explored um, hand percussion and different types of percussion with so many different uh, world musics. I know you're willing to share some music with us today, so could we start with a little bit before we get to talking? Sure, I'd be happy to. <clears throat> This is called an Mbira, M-B-I-R-A. It's from Zimbabwe. The kind of larger term is kalimba, but it's more specifically an Mbira. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
nice. Thank you. Now, we couldn't see your thumbs when you were playing it, the imbira. Um, mm. If you're playing another instrument, would there be a way of like uh, angling? Do you have a, are you using a webcam? Or uh, I, I am not, but let me see if I can um, position it in a way so that people can see my thumbs. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really coming off the, the back of the wood. This is a very hard wood from Zimbabwe. I'm not sure specifically what kind of wood it is. But I tend to like to mic it from, from the back. Right. Yeah. And you have to develop calluses. I was going to say. If you're, if you're playing a lot. <laughs> yeah, I've tried yeah. a few times and it hurt. <laughs> so. Yeah. And there are, you know, softer diatonic or chromatic... Um, uh, kalimbas from all over the world, right? Um, and they're all different. You know, they're different tonalities. Um, this one is pentatonic. It's in D, or D, D minor, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I have a variety of them. And uh, they're such a lovely instrument because they're so transportable. Yeah. You know, you could take it out of nature quite easily. And it's very meditative. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you've been involved in community music over the years, different projects, and it seems to me that's a very accessible instrument for people. Very much so. I've been involved in teaching. Um, probably my my most important influences have been, <clears throat> excuse me, Babatunde Olatunji, the great Nigerian master drummer who brought African music to the U.S. in 1956. He was a student at Moorfield College close personal friend of Martin Luther King's and of John Coltrane's. And he established the first Center for African Music and Culture up in Harlem. Mm -hmm. And I met Bob in 1985 in New York City at Sounds of Brazil, SOBs, mm -hmm. in the village. And uh, he invited me to study with him. So <clears throat> I sought him out at the Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York <clears throat> one summer and I continued to study with him for several years um, so that was my introduction to African music and then David Darling was also someone I met at the Omega Institute great cellist also the founder of music for people and he had a beautiful way of creating community through music making specifically around improvisation mm. whereas Baba's approach and the African approach was more around holding a part down and building building the um, percussive community or ensemble and then having one lead drummer generally mm -hmm. or one lead dancer right <clears throat> so David's concept was more along the lines of jazz and he's a great improviser, classically trained. You know, um, I think he was the first cellist for Paul Winter's consort for many years. Mm -hmm. And we became friends at the Omega Institute, and he became a <clears throat> a mentor of sorts. And, um, and then the third, well, two other important influences for me were um, the Samba schools of Rio. Yeah, I want to talk and about that for sure. <laughs> Yeah. Do you, should we talk about it a little bit now or? Sure. Um, actually, before we get into that, one thing that might be interesting for people to hear is the story I've heard you tell about when you were five years old. Uh, yeah, that is a funny, that is a funny story. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, this really goes back to the beginning and you know, the, the context I think is much larger than music. It's how do you find your calling? You know, how do you find the work that you're meant to do in this lifetime? That's an expression of your soul. And I found that when I was age five, I grew up in a suburb of Cleveland, Ohio. My parents were um, immigrants from Poland. Uh, they were in hiding most of the war. They were hit by two Catholic families. My, my family's Jewish. Um, a good part of my family was wiped out. I have my parents behind me um, here. 
and um, so and I was you know it was a hard upbringing it was a pretty a lot of anxiety in the house you know it was, uh, they came with a lot of trauma having been displaced and gone to different countries including France and Italy and Uruguay and finally got safe passage to the United States so that's kind of the backdrop so I was not a very happy camper as a kid um, I look at a picture of me at age four and I look pretty depressed, pretty sad. And then I look at a picture of me at age five and I'm like elated. And the difference was music. So music found me at age five. I went to a classroom assembly at Lomond Elementary School. And, uh, you know, it was grades kindergarten, K through six and we were all sitting on the floor in the auditorium it was a school assembly chirping like little birds excited because we didn't have to go to class and the principal um mr travis uh came on the loudspeaker and said and now kids um you're going to be exposed to something that probably you've never heard before and that could make a big impact on your lives. I have no idea why he had that insight into music, but the purple plush curtains parted and all of a sudden there was this tall African-American man dressed in a dashiki, West African clothing, uh, starting to solo on four conga drums. Solo, no other accompaniment. He was a good player, and he was playing Guawanco from Cuba. From Cuba, this was my first introduction to African-based music, to Afro-Cuban music, and it totally possessed me. I was a shy kid, but I got up and I started dancing in front of the whole school. And what do you think the first reaction was from the kids? They would have laughed. Exactly. They were laughing, they were pointing, they were making fun of me. Um, and I had no self-consciousness at all. I was just swept away by the power of this incredible groove and the melodic nature of the rhythm because there were four different mm -hmm. tones, right? And, um, and if that was not enough for our little sensitive nervous systems to absorb, uh, for some reason, they added a strobe on stage. So his actions were stopped down. While, so, you know, this was like an early psychedelic experience, right? The music, the lighting, just the vibe. And so I, I got up and started dancing. The kids started making fun of me. But I noticed something. I persevered. And within about one minute, someone else got up and started to dance. And then all of a sudden it was one after another until almost everybody in the auditorium, meaning 500 people, including board members, teachers, parents, kids, were all shaking their butts together. So it was a really extraordinary experience. And a voice went off in my head that said, I want to do this someday. And I had no idea what that meant, but it became the basis of my life's work to explore rhythm from different cultures and to see how it can be used as, as a force for wellness, for unity, for collaboration, for, um, positivity and, f and, um, you know, cross-cultural collaboration. So, so I followed that thread and um, I think what was next for me is that there was a chair. People often say, well, what was your first instrument? And I will say it was a chair in my brother's room. He had a really nice mahogany chair. And I noticed that when I played Santana albums, again, Afro-Cuban music, um, 
I could produce, I could reproduce those conga parts on the chair. Mm -hmm. So my first instrument for a year, I played the chair. I was first chair in my own orchestra. And then my parents finally said, I don't think this is a passing fancy. I think we need to buy him some drums. They tried to steer me into other, you know, less loud instruments, but, um, and I remember my father taking me on a field trip <clears throat> to Di Fiore's House of Music on Cleveland's West Side. And it was my first experience of a music store. And I remember the smell, like when you go into a music store, especially as a kid, it's just like a palace. You know, there's guitars and drums and people are generally happy and playing thing. I mean, you know, it's a pretty cool thing. So um, he said, well, what do you want? And I don't know why, but I saw, and this is almost like a mythic story, right? <laughs> I saw these bongos that were like almost up by the ceiling. And I remember them as very tall ceilings. And it was precariously perched on this huge pile. And they were white oak and made by Gonbops. And uh, I'm pretty sure Gonbops has, they may have gone out of business by now, but in the day they made incredible congas and bongos, handmade, pretty sure in California. And um, so I said, I want those. And then took them down. And of course they were like the most expensive bongos. And to my dad's credit, I think they were like $125, you know, back in the day, that was, that was a lot. So he said, okay. So I play the hell out of those things. And so I started learning how to play conga parts and bongo parts, listening to Santana records. And then I got into Chick Corea and Miles Davis and, um, on meter times through Dave Brubeck. Mm. And, um, and then I discovered Brazil through Ayerto, probably through Miles Davis, through mm -hmm. Chick Corea, what, you know, and there was something about the Brazilian beat and Samba that I don't know, just, you know, I entrained to. And, um, so I bought some congas. I took some lessons as mostly self-taught. But I studied with a really good teacher who really knew Afro-Cuban music. My technique got better. I had a band in high school called the Dukes of Earl. It was a 10-piece band, doo-wop, early rock and roll. But in between sets, we would do Miles Davis and Chicoria tunes. Rather unusual combination of music. Um, and in 1989... I successfully wrote and was awarded a grant to study music in the Amazon. Mm -hmm. So um, I was living in St. Louis at the time, grew up in Cleveland, went to school in St. Louis, was the jazz director of my radio station, got a chance to meet and interview Pat Metheny mm -hmm. when his first quartet album came out, got to meet and interview and hang out with the great Bill Evans a few months before he passed, passed away. And I just recently met his last bass player, Mark Johnson, the incredible Mark Johnson, who's married to Eliani Elias, incredible uh, Brazilian jazz pianist and vocalist. And we were both reminiscing about that concert. Um, so I fell hard for Brazil. I went in August of 1989 I think August 9th sticks out in my mind. Mm -hmm. And um, I landed in Rio and I did this whole thing, which I think is really important when you're, you fall in love with another culture and then you, you actually get to go to the culture, you know? And um, I said, okay, I'm just a student here. I'm a beginner. I want to really respect the culture. I want to study with, you know, really top people. Um, I kind of did like an ego adjustment, which I think was pretty cool thing to do. 
but I was met by remarkable magic. And what happened is that um, my first night in Rio, I heard one of the greatest samba singers, uh, Marcin Davila. I don't know who to compare him to in um, here, mm -hmm. but it would be like maybe meeting Howling Wolf or Chuck Berry or, you know, and um, I befriended his daughter and his family and his daughter, Marchinalia, is now a very famous samba singer, root samba singer, uh, and performs all over the world. We're still close friends. And um, she invited me to come and study with their samba school. So in Brazil, people prepare for carnival all year around. It's more than just a cultural thing. It's a spiritual, religious thing. And they're sort and, of community centers as well, the samba schools? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, they're social clubs. They're, um, they're neighborhood clubs. Um, <laughs> they're oftentimes funded by drugs and, you know, gangs. Mm -hmm. Um you know, where someone will be their patron. Yeah. Um, and it's really mostly for the black people of Brazil, the poor people from the favelas, from the slums. Um, and um, this is their time to kind of regain imaginal power in society, you know, carnival, has traditionally been an inversion of the social order mm -hmm. in many ways. Um, in Roman times, the Saturnalia festival, all the way up through, you know, how it's been reclaimed in various African diaspora mm -hmm. communities. So, so I got, I mean, talk about an introduction to Samba and, you know, um, I, I like, you know, met, the king of samba and my first night in brazil but i've had continual experiences like that in brazil i feel more at home there than i do in the u.s um how was your portuguese when you first went oh absolutely horrible i mean those people were so patient and mm -hmm. so kind to me but look they could tell that i had a true passion for their culture and that i had studied and gained a lot on my own mm -hmm which they said, yeah, that's how you play tambourine. Where'd you learn that? You know, mm -hmm. I learned from books and listening to records and, you know, and they saw that I wanted to apply myself and I wanted to learn the language. And so, you know, they met me, they met me and accepted me and took me to really remarkable places. I just had a beautiful conversation with Brian Laverne Davis, who's the uh, percussionist for Pink Martini, mm -hmm. we're, we're good buddies. And he also has studied Afro-Cuban music and Brazilian music. And um, he also was fortunate enough to gain entrance into the top levels of Samba. And so we, we traded some incredible stories a couple of weeks ago about those experiences, you know, and, um, so I, you know, I got in on the ground floor and then um, I continued to study and I created a Samba school. Before, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely want to hear about that. There's a couple things I wanted to ask you about, Gary. Yeah. One of them was actually, I, I heard you tell this story, which really says a lot about your wonderful chutzpah of getting a ticket to go to the first carnival. Yeah. <laughs> Reminding me of some great stories. And yeah, I think this is important for people to know like if you have a dream go for it you know don't let your own internal demons say uh i don't have the money or blah 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 you know so here i was i had been invited to return a few months later after this first trip by marcin's family and by samba school villa villa isabel in rio one of the it's a 12 or 16, uh, 14, uh, something. There's a certain number of class A professional Samba schools, kind of like the major and the minor leagues, mm -hmm. right? So um, they said, a fantasia will be waiting for you, which means the 
the uniform, right? I had it, they measured me. They said, this will be ready for you. You have to come back. Well, I didn't really have the money. I was working for the Missouri Arts Council at that time in St. Louis, and I was teaching part-time. I created One World Music as a 501c3. It was just starting to get funding. And um, so I thought, what the hell? I will write an airline and tell them that they should give me a round-trip ticket that I have the chance to perform in Brazilian Carnival, this gringo from North America. And in return, I, I was starting to bring a program called Synergy Through Samba into corporate America. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I collected a lot of instruments. I worked on a deal with the Remo Drum Company. I actually got to meet and hang out with Remo Belly several times. We got to be friends. And um, you could see how much good fortune and grace I had, you know, just all these things happen, really. But, um, you know, there's a saying that the gods help those who help themselves. So when you, and Goethe has a beautiful quote about, you know, uh, boldness has magic to it, you know, that when you take action, that oftentimes the mystery will meet you. And that's what happened. I, um, I looked up who the vice president of marketing was, and I wrote him a letter. I don't remember if I typed it out. I think this was before well, it wasn't before computers, who knows? But at any rate, I wrote the guy a letter and thinking nothing's gonna happen. Well, a week later, I got a call from that person's admin saying, Mr. So-and-so was fascinated by your offer and would like to speak to you about it. And so um, I called in one day and um, and they said, uh, I said, this is Gary Musinski. I'd like to talk to Mr. I think his name was Ladd. I don't remember his name. And the secretary said, can I tell him who you're with? And, you know, my cat at the time was on my desk. And I said, tell him I'm with my cat. Who are you with? Well, she hung up the phone, called back, gave her a little bit of a better answer, apparently. And spoke to the guy and he said, yeah, we like your offer, but instead of teaching our executives how to play Samba, what if you put together a band and played for one of our promotional conferences? And so that's what I did. I traveled to Chicago. I hired a few Chicago musicians, uh, some from Brazil, and we, we played at their booth. And sure enough, they sent me a round trip ticket to go to Rio and I went to Carnival and what a life-changing experience that was. The costumes are something I was looking up uh, images yeah. from the, what did it feel like when you put, put that on? I didn't really like my costume. <laughs> you know, the costumes, first of all, you have to <coughs> realize, that you're talking about like 300 people to one samba school. Yeah. I'm sorry, thousands, 300 just in the percussion section. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So, so the percussion section, the bateria, is generally wearing one type of costume. Mm -hmm. The dancers are wearing different costumes, but it's basically like a moving opera. Mm -hmm. You know, you have 90 minutes to complete your passage. This is in Rio, mm -hmm. not in Bahia or Olinda. Those are different carnival experiences. But in Rio, you have 90 minutes and it's timed and you're disqualified if you're over that. And they're judging it based on 10 or 12 different criteria. And um, um, and the different costumes tell part of a story. So there's a song called an Enhedu, which is like a theme samba. Mm -hmm. It's a story, and it might be about the state of the Amazon, 
or it might be on the 200th anniversary of slavery, or it might be on the infiltration of big oil in Brazil, you know, whatever. It's oftentimes a political theme, mm -hmm. not always, but oftentimes. And then the different sections are maybe relating to one line or one lyric. So they're bringing that alive. So the year that I was dancing with the parading with the Samba School, there was a line about the Bandarantes, the, um, the, you know, not exactly soldiers, but something like that close to the border near the Amazon in the Northeast of Brazil. And so we were dressed like Bandarantes and we had funny little hats and we were, <laughs> we were carrying fake rifles. Oh, wow. So you can imagine that when you're arriving to set up for Brazilian Carnival in Rio, you're mostly either walking or you're taking buses or um, if you're wealthy enough, you're taking a taxi. Um, but a lot of people are going through the metro. Mm -hmm. So there are people from all these different Samba schools crowded together on the metro. So you've got feathers in your face and you know, we're holding a bundle of rifles and you emerge from the main metro area in Rio um, where the judging takes place, the parading. You emerge out of the ground and you see thousands of people in amazing costumes and the music, at least the year I was there that was playing, what, what would you imagine would be playing over the loudspeaker to kind of welcome people? No idea. Strauss waltzes, <laughs> right? So it, it's very <laughs> otherworldly, you know? So it's, it's a real, and it's, it can be dangerous. There were a couple times when it felt like I was going to get crushed yeah. by a crowd. So, <laughs> but I went to, I guess I just did one Brazilian carnival in Rio, one in Bahia. I was supposed to do another one in Olinda, Recife, north of the state of Bahia, for a different kind of music, which is maracatu, mm -hmm. a more mixture of Af Afro uh, and Indian. And, but when I was in Salvador Bahia, 1994, I believe I got an offer. The head of Olodum, the great African bloc, uh, another parading troupe, but more based on Afro-Brazilian music and Bahian music, different than Rio Samba. Um, he invited me to parade with Olodum in 1994 in and I was the only white man um, in a sea of 300 men in the in the percussion section. So it was a huge honor, you know. Uh, Neguinho do Samba, who you know met Paul Simon, and of course Paul Simon brought Ola Doom into his album Rhythm of the Saints, mm -hmm. and went on tour with Paul Simon, kind of put them on the map. Hmm. Interestingly enough, maybe I look a tiny bit like Paul Simon, but when I was in Brazil, a lot of people thought I was Paul Simon. <laughs> I, I said, you know, I would love to have his budget, but I'm sorry, I'm not Paul Simon. Um, but I was the official beer holder that year for um, there is an Afro Blanco in Salvador, Bahia. Again, the Rio Samba schools are organized in Samba schools. Mm -hmm. In Bahia, they're called the Afro Blancos. And they're also very large contingents of percussion and dancers and these things called trio electricos, which are huge flatbed trucks mm. that move slowly through the street with thousands of people singing and dancing behind them. Mm -hmm. And on top, they have blaring loudspeakers. And 
because I was there and with a dear friend of mine who has since passed, Bob Fleming. He was a professional photographer. We got word that you could score international press passes at the governor's office if you arrived before 5 p.m. on a certain day. And these press passes and badges, I don't know if I still have mine, but they allow you to go anywhere you want in Carnival, including up into the Trio Electricos, which are moving through the street. Wow. So it provides an incredible three-story up view of Carnival. Um, and I, Bob was there with his professional gear, Nikon. I was there with my little Kodak camera, disposable. But they treated me like a famous professional photographer. And so I cozied up to the front of the Trio Electrico. And this was for Filios Giganji, which means the sons and daughters of Gandhi. So they basically have adopted nonviolence mm -hmm. and other aspects of Gandhi's life and philosophy <coughs> as their patron saint. So all of these people are dressed in turbans and um, they're playing Afoche rhythms, a type of Afro-Brazilian rhythm that you hear in Bahia a lot. Um, they're singing, they're playing these large agogos. This is partially what they're known for. It's these large agogos and atabaques. We might call them conga drums, but in Brazil, they're called atabaques, and they're three um, sizes. They're also used for candomblé drumming, for the you know syncretic, synchronistic um, expression of, of worship of African orishas, orishas or um, deities. So you find this in Cuba, you find this in New Orleans through voodoo, you find this in Brazil. So it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating experience. And Gandhi Jr., um, he looked, he really looks like Mahatma Gandhi. He's wearing, you know, he's bald. He looks like he could be from India, although Gandhi was from South Africa. But, um, and he wanted me to hold his beer. So I was official beer holder. And every once in a while, he would say, Onji mir cerveja, which means, where's my beer? And I'd hand it to him, and he would bless me with the beer. And then hand me back the beer to hold. So it was a, a rather <laughs> entertaining cultural experience and so that was that was my time in Bahia. So could you actually show us some of the typical samba rhythms? Do you have any instruments there that would be possible to? Um, let's see what can I what can I um, use for samba? Sure um, yeah let me let me grab a couple things. Sure thanks. Yeah so there's, there's a lot of different kinds of samba and uh, but there are certain common elements to samba um, and there are certain instruments used for samba um, there's a very low deep drum called the surdo a cylindrical shaped drum a samba is really a mixture of <clears throat> a military march from Portugal mm -hmm. so Western measured uh, one two it's in two four, uh, two four. Um, but unlike a march, like a Sousa march, uh, Samba is inverted in that the strong beat occurs on the second beat, not the first. A march is about marshalling people, sending them to war or showing off military strength. Samba floats because the... I wanted to ask you about some of the micro grooves. They're sort of unique, you know, that it's not quite a straight, that, that the subdivisions aren't exactly. That's true. That's very true. Um, 
and that's what makes it swing mm -hmm. and that's what makes it also hard to really understand the brazilian groove because if you if you look at the way it's written and you play this a strength 16th note it loses its its flavor its swing yes. um so for example the ago go so in in african music the bell is very important mm -hmm. you know the bell kind of sets it's the it's the clave if you will it's the uh, which means key in spanish mm -hmm. and portuguese um and um so in samba there could be different bell parts and again there's samba mixed with reggae and bahia samba hege which is a different feel but it all there are certain similarities so two tones mm -hmm. and so an example could be and but you can unlike the african bell or the latin bell the beauty, beauty of the brazilian double bell is you can click these two parts together so you can get listeners who aren't watching the video if we could just describe the way the bells are attached they're sort of fused together and it's sort of yeah flexible. they're fused, they're they're yeah. they're all part of the same piece of metal yeah and um you know there's just a high bell and a low bell mm -hmm. basically yeah thank you yeah so that's one instrument and you know so for So these are other types of rhythms and bell parts, but there's, so there are lots of different bell parts depending on the rhythm. And then, but the underlying groove for Samba is again, we tend, Westerners tend to think of this in four because some of the patterns last four beats, but mm -hmm. in Brazil, they really think of this as a two beat rhythm. So this is um, a great drum. It's called a surdo. And again, this is very much from African music, that there are three different surdos. There's like the mother drum, the father drum, and in some ways the baby drum. So you find this in African music. And um, it's also replicated in samba. So this is actually the highest pitch. It's the baby drum, and it does the most soloing. So... But the basic samba rhythm is Thank you. Yeah, and the um, you know the syncopations with the left hand are what make it swing. And um, so um, yeah, so in a bateria in Rio with three hundred percussionists, you might have fifty certos. Wow. And so that's that's the heartbeat. Yeah. Before we leave this whole uh, Samba Parade topic, which is fascinating, so you mentioned each school has 90 minutes and there might be 15 of the Class A schools going past. So the judges are judging for an entire day, practically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, Carnival pretty much lasts a whole week. Yeah. And um, I told you I was supposed to go to Recife, to Olinda, to hear the Maracatu, different rhythm. Mm -hmm. Uh, different types of instruments. Yes, they have an ago go, but it's a different type. And yes, they have three low drums, but 
they're they're different than the Cerdo. Um, and um, but I got this amazing offer I couldn't turn down to parade with Oladum and Bahia. So I went to Os Olinda Hesife um, afterwards. Um, and it was like a war zone. It was like a bomb had been dropped because these people had been up and partying nonstop for a week. So like after Carnival, nothing was happening. It was quiet. You didn't really see people. They were all catching up on their sleep or they had colds or flus or, you know. Um, so yeah, it goes on for at least a week. And in some ways, you know, the month preceding the rehearsals intensify, you know. Mm. So. Wow. And then you started the Samba school in the Midwest, the first one of the first Samba schools in the States, from what I understand. Right. That well in the country. Actually. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I got funding, you know, from an arts agency and um, I had a troupe of about 10 people. We were called the Sambistas. We did an album together called Rhythm Fest. Uh, it wasn't just samba, it was a percussion ensemble. So some of it was, uh, you know, uh, informed by Afro-Brazilian music. Some of it was um, inspired by rumba and Afro-Cuban music. Some of it was just percussion mixed with jazz. Uh, but we, uh, I had the ensemble for eight years and um, we had quite a following and uh, so my life at the time was being a visiting artist in schools, teaching percussion. And then, um, uh, and then doing workshops for the general public for adults, as well as mm -hmm. for older adults in their seventies, eighties and nineties in shopping centers, learning Samba and doing parades up and down the escalators. Wow. That's fantastic. These people were so joyous and so full of life. And people were like, what's good? People didn't know quite. We're not used to seeing older adults, happy, vibrant, creating. And, and this was the Midwest and people weren't like quite sure what box to put them in. But uh, we used to hand out egg shakers and we'd have other people that would abandon their shopping and yeah. kind of go off with us. So, um, yeah. That's great. By the way, when I said the States, that's because I'm Canadian. So we refer to your country as the States. I, I, sometimes I forget it's Canadianism, like all of America. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I do want to talk about the handpan. And w is, do you have one close by? I know you must have a few. I, I do. I do. Um, yeah, I'm happy to wax on a little bit about the handpan. Because you were uh, one of the sort of an early adopter of what is now a really, really popular instrument. Yes. Um, I discovered the hand pan probably in 2003. Hmm. They first came out in 2001. They were made by two artisans in um, Bern, outside of Bern, Switzerland. Right. So I never met uh, Felix and Sabina directly, but... I was in touch with them. I had some close friends who mm. would go to the House of Hung, as it was yeah. called, in the um, the um, countryside of Bern, and they they were pioneers. They had studied how to make steel drums for about twenty to thirty years preceding the invention of the the Hung, mm -hmm. H A N G. Um, and uh, basically it was their idea to combine the sound of uh, Trinidadian and Tobago steel pans. <laughs> side and so so
so uh, this side, um, you hear this instrument in South India called the gatam, mm -hmm. which is like an udu drum in Nigeria. It's referred to as an udu drum. It used to be used for carrying water or liquids. It's a ceramic pot. Mm -hmm. um, and you can purchase it. I, I have a neuter drum. I can play it mm -hmm. later. But um, so what an incredible idea to bring these three different sounds together to create a new acoustic hybrid instrument. And... So I discovered this instrument in a medieval castle in Croatia in 2003. I had arrived for an arts and business conference because the other thing I do through my company, Orchestrating Excellence, is I bring music making processes into organizations for innovation, leadership development, team development, and company milestones, mm -hmm. you know, keynotes around uh, the art of listening um, and looking at music as a powerful metaphor for collaboration and creativity. So, um, so I was there for an arts and business conference. And when I walked into the, um, the entrance uh, of this medieval castle from the 13th century, I heard three different hand pans playing and I thought I had gone to heaven or something, you know, it was just so incredible. And so I approached one of the members. He's become a really close friend, Jason Sampson. Uh, Jason, if you listen to this program, we should get you on here to be interviewed, but he's a great percussionist, composer, great hand pan player. Mm -hmm. and has become a really dear friend. He lives in Den Haag and the, the Netherlands. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, him and Mark Van Roon and one other person were playing Pan Pan, and it was like, holy crap, you know, beam me up. <laughs> so the next summer I went to study vocal improvisation with Bobby McFerrin at the Omega Institute. And I look and outside, outside the dining hall, there are like 25 hand pans in, in the lawn, different modes, different tunings. And at that time they had a North American distributor for the hung. Mm -hmm. Hung by the way means hand or side of the mountain in the Bernese dialect of Swiss German. Okay. And uh, I said, oh, my God, I would like a family of three. You know, it's really influenced by what I heard in Croatia. And I wanted to replicate that. So I got three of them. I think each one cost me 500 bucks. Um, those original ones are now worth eight grand and more because mm -hmm. they're not made anymore. And they're collector's yeah. items, right? So... Um, who knew there would be a hung bubble? any rate, so um, I purchased three, and I started falling in love with the hand pan. Uh, now it's called hand pan or pan tam. Two appropriate words for this instrument. Mm -hmm. I, I like hand pan. That's what I call it. Sometimes people say, oh, you play a hung or a hang. Well, not really. Um, it was, that was a very specific instrument made by pan art mm -hmm. from Switzerland. <clears throat> and in about 2013, they decided to not make it anymore. They were pissed at other people making them and they didn't have a strong international copyright mm -hmm. on their IP and it was impossible to get them. And there was a world growing worldwide demand. So of course, other people, it took people a while to figure out how to make them well. And, um, but there are probably about 
20 really good makers around the world now. And um, this one was made by Josh Rivera in North Carolina. Veritas Sound. It's a really nice one. He customized this to my specifications because I originally had an eight note hung mm -hmm. with the scale D harmonic minor. And I've written some songs with it that I wanted to replicate again. So, um, different kinds of metal used to make these um, my the one I like the best right now is called nitrided steel it's it's heated at a very high level it's a very um, it's a heavier and um, harder metal mm. uh, so it stays in tune longer um, and I like the overtones uh, this particular one is my first stainless steel hand pan. <coughs> it's a softer metal. It has a longer sustain. Who needs reverb when you have a hand pan like this? Right? Yeah. It's a very long decay. Um, and it's a little bit lighter so you know different makers are making them differently there are different helm holt helm holt frequencies these are tuned to mm -hmm. um, oftentimes you can hear um, the octave in the fifth most prominently <laughs> And then, so then the third type of steel is called amber steel. And I'm not yet exactly sure what's different about what they're calling ember or amber steel compared to these two other types of steel. Hmm. And there's so much variance now in the hand pan world. Uh, type of material, the circumference, the thickness, whether people are hand making the pans, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from form, form, a form, form fitting, mm -hmm. and then hand hammering. There are more production oriented versions now at lower cost points. So one question I get from people is, well, how much does this instrument cost? I heard it's very expensive. Um, I'd say, 1200 is about the entry level for a decent hand pan mm -hmm. to about 2500. Um, there are ones that are 2500 to 8000. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted 16, 17, 20 notes, ah. if you wanted um, full chromaticism, if you wanted additional notes on the bottom, these are extremely hard and time consuming things. Yeah. Right. So that's where the price starts to go up. Um, and so basically when people say, well, I really want a hand pan. What, what maker should I buy one from? What, what scale, uh, how much should I spend? How do I know if it's a good one? So these are complex questions, but generally, um, I do offer a consulting service for, you know, 90 minutes, basically just to get, it could be in person if they're in the Bay area, otherwise they do it on zoom, but it's basic orientation on what you should look for different scales, different manufacturing techniques. I mean, here I have three or four different kinds, so I can show people, you know, if you 
If you like the feeling and sound of stainless steel, mm -hmm. uh, this is what it's like. If you want nitrated, this is what it's like. This is what a C-sharp minor pentatonic sounds like. This is what a D minor, D harmonic minor sounds like. This is what a B minor, this is what an E major, you know. So there are a lot of um, decisions to be made, but it's better just to kind of dive in and get started. Mm -hmm. But I tell people, when you hear a particular scale, if it moves you emotionally, if there's something like there's something about this D harmonic minor. That's very mysterious. It's dark. It's like dark roast coffee, you know? And, um, I, I recently played this for one of the greatest living big band arrangers in the world, Nilor Proveta from Brazil. I was just hung out with him for a few weeks, for a week in the Redwoods playing incredible music. And I played this for him and he said, wow, this takes me to the Middle East. So, you know, different scales, they're, each scale has its own journey it'll take you on. So that's the beautiful thing about hand pans and hand pan improvisations is their musical journeys. Um, and that's true with, um, it's true with any scales, but modes and pentatonic scales. Um, I got an interesting discussion with a very talented Western classical trained musician on the virtues of chromaticism versus the hand pan. And of course you can get chromatic handpans now. But I said, well, you know, most of the world's folk music is pentatonic. So why do you think that chromaticism should be higher and mightier? Um, I think it depends on the emotional truth conveyed and the resonance with a particular scale uh, rather than how many notes you can play. And I said, you know, if you look at kind of blue or modal jazz. Um, you know, I don't think jo John Coltrane and Miles Davis felt too constrained by the constraints they imposed because it opened other doors to uh, being able to solo. And Stephen Nakmanovich, Nakmanovich, who wrote two beautiful books, and actually, didn't you... Did yes, you know? I, yeah, I, he was featured on this podcast, which okay, is uh, great. Yeah. So he has a seminal book called um, The Art of Improvisation in Music and Life. Yeah. And also his latest one is called As Is, I believe. No, the, the Art of Is is his second oh, most recent is. book. His first one is called Free Play. Oh, Free Play. Yeah, and it's actually because of Stephen, I actually bought a handpan because he oh. talked about how it's good to play some an instrument that's like, that you're a beginner on for improvisation and as a violinist i th i was really um attracted to the idea of a percussion instrument that was also melodic and yeah. having a limitation of notes is actually helpful to me as an improviser exactly my, my point exactly um mm -hmm. people ask me um is it hard to play um and my response is yes and no it takes some skill you have to spend some time with it. You have to fall in love with it. And um, you can't worry about hitting a wrong note. In a way, you can't hit a wrong note because all the notes are, they like one another. By the way, the best definition I've heard of harmony is by um, Paul McCartney, who says, um, an interviewer asked him, well, how do you think of harmony? He said, I find notes that like other notes. I think there's something beautifully poetic about that. So, um, yeah, those constraints open up worlds. Um, so my approach to teaching handpan is really teaching music and improvisation and compositional forms and understanding ostinato, understanding pattern and variation, understanding tension and release understanding different time signatures 
and how to create tension and release and basically storytelling through mm -hmm. music you know what's the message what's the story what's the journey what's the beginning point how do you enter where do you take people um that's really how i approach teaching hand pad and um you know the technique is important but only in service to these other elements i think the hand pen is definitely associated with meditation and i know you've done some of that like with meditators um people leading meditations and jack cornfield's name came up with regard to yourself and, and i was like oh that guy and i think the first guided meditations i did back in probably like 1990 or something was jack cornfield like little cassette tapes i bought you know it's just yeah. one of those things he's yeah. really a leader yeah well, Spirit Rock is about 10 minutes or 15 minutes from where I live. I've gotten to know Jack over the last 25 years, and I've opened for him many times or closed for him at Spirit Rock mm -hmm. or, um, you know, for hundreds of people. And um, it was very interesting. I had some friends in from out of town yesterday, and, you know, I have a puppy who can be very spirited, especially when we have guests. And she was, you know, very worked up. And then I played the hand pan and all of a sudden she just went into this calm thing, you know, almost sleeping. And she said, my friend said, wow, that was, that was amazing. I, I said, yeah, it's, it's a very powerful instrument in terms of, you know, and Jack Cornfield, his beautiful quote for me is um, that handpan is perfect for meditation. Now, again, you can play in a very busy way. And this is the thing. I love jazz. I love jazz. And sometimes people that are into fusion or bebop, there's, there's a density of notes, mm -hmm. you know, and I tend to like more spacious music. Uh, even if it's fast, there's a way of, you know, creating space. And the hand band's perfect for that, but I can play. intention is um, usually in a jazz piece um, your intention is not necessarily to induce trance if you listen to certain players like um, I mean certainly John Coltrane um, but he always had a spiritual element to his music um, if you listen to um, uh, Ibdul Ibrahim from South Africa, I've had the honor of hearing him live two or three times. I've always been struck by there's some quality that is so deep. Um, it's not about the virtuosity it's really about emotional truth or being touched on a very profound level and um it's an energetic quality so that's that's really what i try and do with my music and that kind of brings us to my current album roots and wings uh, it's subtitled medicine music 
and as um, influences, I cite Yo-Yo Ma's Silk Road Project and Bobby McFerrin's Medicine Music, Medicine Man album. Uh, I've known Bobby for 30 years and I've had the honor to <coughs> jam with him a few times. And I'm also hoping that he'll show up at our Freight and Salvage show on November 17th because I'm bringing in one of his very favorite singers from India, Vadar Jashri Venagopal, mm -hmm. who has collaborated with Bobby. And um, so there's a chance Bobby might, um, might show up since he lives locally now. But um, yeah, I've always been drawn by some of Bobby's music in terms of chant and uh, holding something for a long time. Mm -hmm. So you find this in African music, you find it in Moroccan music, you find it in, um, to some extent, Indian classical music, because um, the intention in some ways is to settle the nervous system. In people like Terry Riley or, um, um, Philip Glass in quote unquote the minimalist school you often uh, have uh, pieces that are uh, long form ostinatos with other pieces that change slowly over time and you know it's a very different way of tuning to music than what we're used to in terms of chord changes Again, it's a different, it's a different effect on the nervous system. Um, in raga music, whether it's North Indian, Hindustani classical music, or South Indian Carnatic music, you also oftentimes have a drone. Yeah. Um, so I, I, those elements have informed my what I love and what I try and bring into my music. The hand pan is central. Because I don't play keyboard, so I use it as a tonal center. I use it as a way of creating melodies um, that allow me to begin to create harmony and interlocking patterns with other melodic harmonic instruments. Yeah, I, I really think it's a, a wonderful album. I enjoy it very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, it won the top global music award last year with more than 10,000 entries. So I was um, ecstatic, you know. Um, um, and then it, they voted it one of the top 10 CDs or albums released. It's now in the Grammys for consideration. If there are any uh, recording academy voters out there, <laughs> please vote for Roots and Wings. Um, We'll see. We'll see what happens. But um, yeah, so I've tried to bring these different musical traditions into my compositions, into my music, so that there's a... I just played it for an incredible musical shaman, Tito La Rosa, who lives in Cusco, Peru. I just saw him last week. He was visiting. And he's actually on the CD. Yeah. And, and he, he, and he yeah. invited you to... Peru a few years ago right. Right, to do some teaching. Right. Yeah. I went to Peru to perform with him in Lima. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Cusco. He wasn't living in Cusco at the time. I had to see Machu Picchu and, you know, um, what an incredible culture. I mean, the way they've developed the flute there, all of the different Andean flutes. And he's a master at that. So in between the longer pieces of music on the CD, you have these incredible, I call them moments of sonic sorbet. They're really intent, they're intended to kind of clear the oral palate, if you yeah. will. Um, so rather than dance a lot of different instruments, just this purity of tone. So we have Tito on the Cana flute from Peru, beautiful solo he recorded here in Marin County when he was here. And um, one of the great oud players in the world, uh, Yair Dalal, 
I think it'd be great for you to interview Yair and Tito. Yeah. Um, and um, two incredible musicians from China. Yes, I love that track. It's beautiful. Oh, it is beautiful. It's kind of this bluesy, guy, actually. Sorry. Yeah. Well, it's great that you you heard that. Yeah. It's so soulful. He's playing the Chinese Gu Chin, which is a seven string lap zither. Actually, he has it on a table. Um, it's a 4,000 year old instrument. Not only is this guy a master of it, um, Master Wang, uh, Master Wang, but um, he builds these things. He's got a workshop compound. This guy is like a Renaissance man. I'm sure there's another term for it in China, but he does landscaping. He does interior design. He uh, builds these instruments. These instruments start at $50,000. Um, he showed me the process of it takes two or three months to make one instrument. And um, I got to hang out with him for a day and meet his disciple, who also plays the Chinese chow, the flute. And so, yeah, that beautiful piece called Waking Before Dawn. Uh, I study Qigong, and it's a gorgeous piece in terms of, you know, to, to understand the concept of space and timing and the, the glissando slides. Microtonality is such an incredible thing, whether you hear it in Arabic music or Indian music, you hear it in American blues um, slide guitar. Yeah. Uh, one of the people I wanted to get on the album and it didn't work out, but I'm hoping to collaborate with in the future is, um, oh my God. Well, I reached out to Jerry Douglas, but I didn't get a response from him. Um, but I also reached out to Roosevelt Collier, who's in a group called Bocante, which is started by Michael League from Snarky Puppy. And when this guy goes into his slide laptop playing, he can make it sound like Aretha singing gospel. I mean, so... On the album, you'll hear a lot, and that's why I love cello, too. It's a fretless instrument. Um, hearing someone attuned to um, not just, uh, not tempered scale, but to have the whole continuum of sound available, and that's the extraordinary thing about Varajashri Venagopal, one of the great rising singers in the world, why Bobby McFerrin loves her. Victor Wooten, I just got a beautiful quote from Victor about Vadi. Anat Cohn, John McLaughlin. Um, all these people are head over heels in love with what she can do as an artist. Yeah, she's great. So I'm over the moon thrilled that she's coming to my show. On November 17th, she's going to be our international guest artist. And my vision for Roots and Wings and One World Music is to do an annual showcase that brings the best of Bay Area musicians or California-based musicians. There are incredible people I know in L.A. with the best global music folks in the world. And um, my interest in music making is to draw from classical music, Western and Eastern, uh, folkloric traditions, and jazz, jazz sensibility, and sometimes uh, the sounds of nature. So yeah. that's kind of my vision for the music side of my work. And then there's the um, empowering people to find their inner musician uh, and I call that workshop and that process um, uh, finding your musical mojo. And that's the tip of the hat to David Darling. Now, Gary, I'm curious, when we had the strict lockdowns in the earlier part of the pandemic, how did that affect your work? Because you're going in live and working with people's 
uh, instruments? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, that was hard, very hard. So it pretty much killed that work. And uh, I have been doing, you know, I do executive and team coaching online for organizations. It's not music based in that we're not playing music together, but we're listening to music to mm -hmm. deepen listening skills. And there are five skills that I teach executives and managers and teams on listening to at three levels, self, other, and system. And listening at a systemic level, we train as musicians to do that. We listen to the room. Mm -hmm. We listen to the music that's emerging as an ensemble. And we ask, how can I further that story? Rather than what's the next flashy thing I can play to show how cool I am. Right? So it's a different way of listening. And then there's synchronizing around a shared beat or in organizational terms around a shared purpose. I call that synchronization. And then there is orchestration, which is an act of directive leadership. There's uh, collaboration, which is more about facilitating and coaching, which is a very different way of leading than being an orchestrator. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, improvisation. How do you shift in the moment? How do you read yeah. a room? How do you attune to um, more subtle voices? And it's really about emergence rather than planning and predictability. And this is something that Stephen, uh, you know, has spent a lot of time giving voice to in his writing. It's cool that you were able to pivot and, and be able to do that stuff online without that. That's that's good because you thought so deeply for so long about those issues that you're able to do that. Yeah, it's not as fun. It's not as fun yeah. as showing up with anywhere from 15 to several thousand drums. I have them warehoused. Wow. Yeah and orchestrating something that goes from cacophony to cohesion in two to four hours with a very high level of somatic learning about issues that are directly resonant and relevant to the workplace. Hmm. Yeah. So, you know, we talked, actually we were just talking about community music in the sense of your corporate life and that playing music is actually better than just listening, you know, to be active is, is so important. And you had mentioned uh, the school drumming program you had done it started in 1987. I think before you started the Samba school. I was, yeah, if you wanted to speak to that, or we could go somewhere else with this. Um, I could speak to that a little bit. Um, in 1987, when I started One World Music, I got a grant to start bringing music and drumming into mostly inner city schools, but also to some white affluent suburban schools in mm -hmm. St. Louis. And my idea was to bring those two groups together for joint performances. Um, so I teach them the same kinds of things. Uh, a lot of it was derived from my teacher at the time, Baba Tunde Olatunji. So here is this white Jewish guy with a Polish last name in St. Louis teaching African-based music to these kids. And when I brought Baba Tunde in at the end of the year, I got more grant money and I raised money and was responsible for an $18,000 budget. And I was, it was my concert. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually produced six, seven different events in seven days. Mm -hmm. He went into five schools. We presented him at a combined performance for 300 kids at the St. Louis Art Museum. So they were bussed in from all over the city. An assembly, like the way I started, right? Yeah. And, then, and then I presented him at the Sheldon Concert Hall. I sold 735 tickets, sold out uh, to our performance. And then one hour up in the ballroom with kind of a world beat concert. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked the guy and his troop. Um, eh. uh, I broke even and that was a great success. Mm -hmm. 
Um, that was when I was 28. I took yeah. that on. So, um, and that was a year before I went to Brazil. So, so I'd go into these schools and do these artist residency programs. And uh, um, I figured out that's a hard way to make a living. Yeah. And I was moving instruments to different schools. And that's when I started to branch out and work with adults in the general public yeah. and to organizations. Yeah, something that's been coming up uh, in the series more and more is just how people are actually making a living because it's not always what people outside the music world think. And, and what also, what is a musician? You know, is it, uh, if you're a professional musician, is it that you're earning most of your living from music? Certainly not, I don't think. It's just, and it, you know, there's a question of semantics, how we use our words. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. Stephen Nachmanovic uh, earned a living mostly as computing, uh, doing, being a computer programmer. And, you know, just a variety of guests I've had were really musicians at the top of their game um, do different jobs. Uh, yeah, it's true for many of us, really, you know. Yeah, um, yeah you got to have multiple revenue streams. And backup and, plans. <laughs> and backup plans yeah. and hopefully live in an inexpensive place. Uh, the San Francisco Bay Area is not one of those, but um, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of people are leaving to find, you know, less expensive places to play. Yeah. I do believe that music and the arts will continue to be an important voice in these huge transitions we're going through. Um, but they're still kind of marginalized in American life unless you are Sting or unless you, you know, there's a very small range of musicians that just really have been able to be commercially successful. But even great musicians, jazz musicians have to tour a lot, you know, they don't necessarily, I think of Joe Lovano or Charles Lloyd. I mean, those guys are just road warriors. So, um, so let me play a piece. Let me improvise a piece. Um, Wonderful. Yeah. And uh, for your listeners, um, yeah, I'd say, maybe I don't need to say this, but um what I try and do, what I sometimes try and do in my improvisations is explore particular motif or th theme or rhythm and kind of expand there. Um, I mean, sometimes when I orient students about how to listen to music, I can say, well, think about it in painting. You can listen to represent, you can look at representational reality. Then you can move to uh, Impressionism. And then you can move to Expressionism, which is more about color and feeling. And then you can look at Rothko. You know, if, you're, if your mindset's just about representational reality, then you can look at Rothko and d dismiss him as, you know, what's this guy trying to do? I can do that. But, um, and same thing with John Coltrane, if you're listening, trying to listen for Duke Ellington and you're listening to um, later Coltrane, it might still not be your, your thing and that's cool. But as, as soon as you listen for color and texture, mm -hmm. it opens up new worlds, so yeah. Well said. So I'll just play the scale.
Thank you. That was so beautiful. Thank you. It was wonderful getting this chance uh, to hear your stories today. It was really inspiring and, and fascinating. So thank you. Thank you. What uh, what struck you? Um, I learned quite a lot about um, the Samba culture that I, I had no idea. And um, I don't know, it's always interesting, you know, because I do a lot of research before I speak to someone. So you know, you have a certain impression of someone in their life and their career, but it's not the same <laughs> as actually getting a chance to sit down and talk with them. Mm. Well, thank you for doing this podcast and for all of the incredible research you do. The questions you ask are so intelligent and insightful, and it's a, a breath of fresh air. Thank you. <laughs> My life is so enriched by getting to know these incredibly inspiring creative guests and their perspectives on their lives and music. Please follow this podcast and sign up for my podcast newsletter to get sneak peeks for upcoming guests and find out about newly published transcripts. <laughs>